Welcome back to the final session of the day. Uh, to get started, we're going to have Mert Sabunchu from Cornell University uh, talking to us. Okay. Hello. Um, so this is my very first ML8C. I've heard great things about it, and I've seen great things so far. Um, but um, one thing, uh, sort of one warning I have for you guys, this is going to be a, quite a technical talk. Um, so, you know, I didn't know how to gauge things because I wasn't familiar with the setup. So hopefully you're not all bored. I'll try to engage all of you. Um, I know this is kind of a broad audience. Um, and so a lot of uh, the research that I do in my lab um, involves analysis. So we sort of the data comes in and we have often a clinical question. Uh, we're sort of creating algorithms that allow us to make sense of the data and, and uh, inform certain clinical decisions. Um, however, today I'm going to talk about um, an upstream sort of problem where we're interested in acquiring, we're interested in building algorithms that help us acquire data in a better way. Um, and I don't think I've heard much about that uh, throughout this conference. I think a lot of machine learning people should think more about the data acquisition process as well, uh, and not just the analysis process. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and, um, and uh, specifically a, a machine learning strategy to do compressed sensing in MRI. So uh, magnetic resonance imaging, um, as you probably all know, uh, is a very, very popular imaging technology in, in many clinical contexts. Um, it has a lot of advantages. It's non-invasive. Uh, it's very versatile. There's lots of different ways you can acquire MRI data that give you different types of contrast. If you give you gives you different types of um, information, you can look at structural anatomy. You can look at functional aspects of anatomy, um, and um, uh, it's it's quite expensive. So it, it's about $2,500 per scan uh, in the U.S. Uh, in a hospital setting. Um, and the reason it's expensive is uh, mostly because it takes uh, quite a long time to acquire the scan. A typical MRI imaging session uh, or a slot in a, in a hospital setting is between 15 and 90 minutes in the US. Um, and, um, and that sort of scan time drives up the costs of the imaging. So the, the whole motivation of, of this work and uh, of these sort of what I'm going to talk about today, is to reduce the scan time to make uh, this technology more accessible and more affordable. So in terms of accelerating the MRI, um, there's broadly speaking two strategies that people uh, look into. Uh, the first strategy is the so-called parallel imaging strategy, where instead of a single receiving coil, you use multiple coils. Um, and you essentially acquire the, the uh, data, the measurements in parallel. The second strategy is the so-called compressed sensing strategy, where essentially you acquire less, da less data than you should um, to fully recover your actual um, uh, images uh, and try to get away with that. Um, and, um, and that's essentially what I'm going to focus on today. Now, these two strategies are not mutually exclusive. Um, actually, in fact, a lot of the MRI acceleration technologies today combine both of them. The problem with the parallel imaging strategy, or, or I guess the, um, the main challenge of the parallel imaging strategy is it requires a hardware modification, whereas the compressed sensing um, approach does not. So here's a very sort of brief outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about what compressed sensing is. Uh, many of you might have heard about it, many of you might have not. Uh, and then I'll bring that into the context of MRI. Um, and then I'm going to formulate our problem. Uh, I'll warn you, I'm going to show some equations. Hopefully it won't be too boring. Uh, I'll try to walk through the equations and make them understandable. Um, and then I will talk about what we propose, our solution that we're going to propose. And surprise, surprise, it will involve neural networks. Um, and then I'll show some experimental results on some retrospectively collected data. Um, and uh, I'll discuss about what we're doing now, now and what the kinds of problems that we're thinking about. Um, by the way, this is relatively new work. It's not like a fully baked, mature project. Um, this, we, we presented the conference version of this work in uh, the IPMI conference at the beginning of 
the, um, the summer uh, in June. Um, the journal version of this project, or the journal version of what I'm talking about, is up on archive as a preprint. It's under review right now. Uh, we've made the code and the trained models available on GitHub as well. Okay. Um, just a bunch of conflicts of interest. Uh, I advise for a company called Clearly, uh, which is a stealth mode startup in New York City, which is in the space of AI and radiology. And, um, and some of these ideas have been uh, discussed in the provisional patent application that we submitted a, a couple of months ago. Um, so let me talk a little bit about sa the sampling theorem. So we Often the, the data or the signal that we're trying to measure is a, a continuous signal, either a continuous function of time or a continuous function of spatial coordinates. Um, however, when we manipulate and represent and communicate the data, we often use digital systems for that, and uh, we represent our data digitally, which means we sample our data uh, at either discrete times or at discrete spatial coordinates. Now, there's this very well-established classic theory of sampling, the uh, classic sampling theory uh, that was originally developed by the sort of the giants of engineering, um, Nyquist and Shannon, uh, which we drill into our undergrads, which says that there's a certain rate at which you need to sample your data, your signal, so that you can, uh, uh, you can losslessly represent your signal, this uh, continuous analog signal, okay? And that rate is often referred to as the Nyquist rate. It's two times the bandwidth of your signal. One thing we fail to tell our students is that the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem is a very sort of general theorem. It talks about signal, or it sort of considers signals in a very general sense. Um, it only assumes that we know the under the, the frequency spectrum or the Fourier uh, uh, spectrum of the, the signal that we are interested in sampling. In reality, when we're looking at applications, we often know much more about our signals, which we often uh, encapsulate in so-called prior models. And the idea of compressed sensing is essentially to exploit those prior models to be able to get away with a smaller number of samples by sampling less. Okay. So essentially, we have this notion of undersampling and compressed sensing, which means that we're going to collect samples of our signal that we're trying to acquire at a rate that is lower than the so-called Nyquist rate uh, in the hope that we can recover the original signal by exploiting some prior information about the signal that we know uh, that we expect. Uh, in a way, this is a very classical ill-posed inverse problem. So we have measurements that we're collecting that we can denote with y. It's kind of a short vector. It's short because we're undersampling. And there's this underlying latent, unobserved, long vector x that we want to recover that sort of reflects the fully sampled data, the fully sampled signal that we're interested in. And uh, there's this sampling process that uh, relates x to y. Uh, and in a, in a linear model, it's essentially a short, fat matrix, which we can call d. OK? And, uh, the, uh, and in this type of application, we have y. We've observed y. Those are the sort of samples that we've collected. We know what d is. We want to recover x. And obviously, there's infinitely many x's that can give us the y that we observe. And the way we approach it is we sort of have a prior model that tells us what are the good x's are or the x's that we believe to expect in our applications. And among all those infinite solutions, we pick the one that is the most likely uh, based on our prior model. This is uh, often solved using a regularized regression framework, um, where essentially you have your forward model, y equals dx. Um, and you're looking for the x that minimizes this discrepancy between dx and the y's that you measure. So dx minus y, y the L2 norm squared of that, for example. Plus, there's a regularization term that tells us uh, it sort of ca uh, reflects the prior on x's. So it tells us like, what's a likely x and what's an unlikely x a priori before seeing any data. Um, I often work with images. In this application, we're looking at MRI scans, which are images. And in images, uh, a very common uh, regularization term that people use is the so-called total variation prior, which essentially says that images, if you look at them in space, uh, look at their gradients, 
they're often quite, the, the, the gradient image is often a lot of zeros, so things don't change. You're sort of looking at uh, intensity values that are pretty uniform. Uh, but there's a small number of pixels where intensity values jump. Those are the edges in the image. And, uh, and you have a sparsity norm or sparsity inducing norm on the edge gradients or edge magnitudes. So let me bring this into the context of MRI. So MRI, uh, rather uniquely, is not an image, uh, imaging modality that's acquired in spatial coordinates, but it's an imaging modality that you acquire in the Fourier domain, OK? Uh, or the frequency domain. And we often refer to that domain in the context of MRI as case space. Um, so uh, here I'm depicting, uh, on the left-hand side, a, um, uh, a slice of a brain MRI scan. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I have the Fourier transform of that. It's the magnitude of the Fourier transform. Um, you might remember the Fourier transform is a, is a complex transformation. Um, and it's been centered, so the middle pixel is essentially the lowest frequency. Um, and you will notice that um, a lot of the content of the image is actually in the lower frequency ranges. And that's typical for a lot of image data. A lot of the uh, content of images will be in the lower frequency range. Now, um, in the context of MRI, when we undersample what happens, so as I said, we acquire the data in MRI in, in Fourier domain, in case space. Um, and, um, and sampling theory tells us if we want a 258 by 200, uh, 256 by 256 image, we uh, need to sample Fourier domain uh, with the same resolution, 256 by 256. Okay? So that's what I would call a fully sampled uh, case space measurement. Um, so that's what we have on, on the left-hand side. So we have a fully sampled Fourier domain measurement. Um, and if we just take the inver inverse Fourier transform, we get this nice-looking brain MRI scan slice. Okay? If we undersample, so we don't measure at every location in that, on that grid, but we measure at, let's say, every fifth pixel okay? uh, on, a, on the same grid, Cartesian grid, but just uh, uniformly uh, measure at, uh, sort of uh, undersample that grid. Um, we, will we will, and just took the inverse Fourier transform of those measurements, um, we will get an image that looks like uh, the one on the second to left, okay? uh, which uh, we refer to as aliasing in the spatial domain. Okay? So you, you will notice that essentially there's these multiple copies of the same image have been sort of superimposed and added. Okay? And it turns out there's no way you can actually recover the original image once this happens. Okay? Um, now, uh, you could, instead, you could do some sort of random sampling. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, uh, sampling, undersampling on a regular grid, you can sort of throw darts at the 256 by 256 grid or somehow randomly uh, choose points to sample from, um, for example, using a uniform distribution. Uh, and um, this is what we have uh, in, the third uh, in the third column. Um, and sorry, I forgot to say, the, ones, the, 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 the pixels that are uh, red uh, on the top row are pixels that, are, that we are sampling from. Okay? Um, and if we uniformly randomly subsample the uh, case space and then took the inverse Fourier transform, we get an image uh, that looks like it sort of has a lot of noise and artifacts. Um, but you can also recognize the underlying MRI scan, underlying brain anatomy. Okay? Uh, if we actually do a uh, random sampling, not uniformly, but somehow something like a Gaussian distribution where we concentrate most of our samples in the center of the Fourier domain uh, and take the inverse Fourier transform, we get even something that looks much, much better, uh, which is essentially the, uh, the lower right image, uh, a brain scan or a brain MRI scan that is, uh, that is somewhat noisy. Okay? So that's the whole notion of compressed sensing in MRI. You want to find, you want to undersample in case space, reconstruct or take the inverse Fourier transform from that of, that, of that image, somehow clean it up, and get to the original good-looking image. Okay? And when we're undersampling in case space, uh, let's say if we undersample by a factor of 10, that often translates to a speed up of a factor of 10. So a 10-minute scan would, would basically be, uh, be reduced to a one-minute scan. Okay? 
This idea uh, was originally uh, proposed and uh, developed by uh, a bunch of people at Berkeley, Mickey Lustig being the uh, lead author on these papers, um, oh, a little over 10 years ago now, uh, about 12 years ago, actually. Uh, so it's basically applying compressed sensing techniques to MRI and undersampling in case space and sort of recovering the original image from those undersampled data. Um, and essentially, we again have a simple forward model, but this time there's one difference. Uh, we have the Fourier transform to insert into that model because we're acquiring data in the Fourier domain or case space. Um, and you know, we have the classical regularized regression setup. We essentially are looking for an X, the original image, and the, uh, the resolution that we want, um, and we want that uh, reconstruction, let's call it, to be consistent with the measurements that we acquire. So u times f times x should be c close to y, where f is the Fourier transform, the Fourier tr uh, f fast Fourier, uh, sorry, the forward Fourier transform. Uh, plus, we have a regularization term. It could be the total variation term that I talked about, or it could be some wavelet uh, coefficients as well, which uh, we know from image processing that wavelet transformations uh, lead to, in natural images lead to, um, it's a sparsifying transformation. So we could be, uh, use a sparsifying or sparsity inducing uh, norm on the wavelet coefficients as our regularizer. So we essentially uh, reduce our problem to an optimization problem or regularized regression problem that we solve given our Y measurements, okay? And that's sort of what most of compressed sensing and MRI was all about in the last 10 years or so. Okay, how do we solve these optimization problems? What kind of regularizers do we use, et cetera, et cetera? Now, um, as you can imagine, over the last few years, um, neural networks have also come into the world of compressed sensing and MRI. Okay, so and uh, the way they've come in is uh, to uh, in, uh, t uh, basically to make that optimization problem. Uh, sort of better, or like uh, in a way to s more rapidly or more efficiently solve that optimization problem that we set up. Okay, uh, there are essentially a couple of ways of uh, looking at this. Uh, one strategy that people have looked at uh, a little earlier on uh, is the so-called unrolled neural networks, where essentially you set up your optimization problem, the regularized regression problem. And uh, you write down the, iterative, uh, it, the iterations that would solve that problem. You write down all the formula for those iterations. And instead of like iteratively solving that, you implement that in a neural network, and each iteration becomes a layer. Okay? Uh, and you know, it's more of an engineering trick, to be honest. Um, that exploits all the nice sort of libraries that we've built for neural networks and uh, can take advantage of things like GPUs. right? Um, and the famous example in my mind for this is the AD, ADMM net uh, that was sort of presented a couple of years ago. There's an alternative strategy uh, which essentially takes an amortized optimization perspective. So the way that you classically think about this regularized opt uh, re uh, optimization problem is you give me a, a y vector and I'm trying to estimate x. To, and the way I estimate it is I solve this regularized regression problem from scratch. Anytime you give me a new y, I have to solve it from scratch. But in reality, I might have lots and lots of brain MRI scans out there, and all of these uh, optimization problems are uh, uh, connected, are sort of very much related. Um, so the amortized optimization perspective is uh, to exploit that fact uh, and essentially try to train a model that will directly uh, uh, solve this optimization problem for you. Okay, so it's basically you're looking for a function that spits out the solution to the optimization problem, uh, and uh, and it's sort of it's more of a learning-based strategy to optimization. So there's been a few papers that have taken that approach to do um, compressed sensing uh, MRI reconstruction. On the other side, uh, the second big problem of compressed sensing is how, where do we undersample? What is the undersampling pattern? Okay, I talked about various ways of doing this. For example, you could undersample on a Cartesian grid, or you can uniformly undersample. You can use a Gaussian distribution to undersample to concentrate uh, on low frequency coefficients. Uh, but the idea of the best strategy, what's the best undersampling strategy, that was really not uh, a, a focus of the literature up until very recently. And the reason it was not a focus is uh, it wasn't because people didn't think about that problem. It was because it's a very, very challenging problem. And I'm, tr I'm going to try to elaborate why. So there's been 
in my mind, three good attempts at solving the undersampling mask, the optimization of the undersampling mask. Uh, one was uh, from 2011, uh, Noel and colleagues uh, essentially uh, said, if you give me a single example of the type of MRI image that I'm going to acquire, I can look at its Fourier transform, I can look at its power spectrum, and I can look at where the power is concentrated, and I will sample more at places where the power is concentrated, which often is the lower frequency parts. Um, and that's essentially my sampling strategy, and there was some rationale behind that, um, because essentially the, um, uh, the, from Parseval's theorem, we know that uh, there's a relationship between the L2 norm in Fourier domain and the L2 norm in the spatial domain. And also, we know that a lot of the variability across uh, subjects, for example, will be in the phase and not the magnitude. Okay? So you could rationalize that approach uh, easily. Um, another attempt was done by Sigurel around the same time, maybe a year before, uh, where essentially they took a Bayesian perspective and said, well, the reconstruction problem, I'm trying to estimate this underlying signal X, um, and uh, there's a post if I have a Bayesian model, it, there's a posterior distribution on that, and the goal of the game is I want to minimize the uncertainty in that posterior distribution, and I essentially set up the problem as um, finding the best samples that minimizes that uncertainty. Uh, and obviously, that's a very, very uh, challenging optimization problem, so they t propose a greedy approach uh, to do that. Um, the other approach that is more recent, uh, proposed by Halder and Kim, uh, takes a um, agnostic strategy in terms of reconstruction methods. So they say, it doesn't matter what reconstruction method I'm going to use to estimate x. Um, this is an estimation problem, so there's this universal lower bound on my uh, estimation variance, which is uh, the kramer rayo bound, and I can use that bound to find the best uh, subsampling strategy that is agnostic to the reconstruction method I'm going to use. Okay? Our view of these uh, works was that um, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be agnostic about the reconstruction method, because um, the reconstruction method uh, is, you know, I, the way I think about it is, uh, there's a tight link between what method I use to reconstruct x, to find x, or estimate x, and where I undersample, okay? And at the end of the day, the only thing I really care about is the quality of that reconstruction, x, okay? Uncertainty uh, or the power, all of that is secondary. It's kind of like proxy loss functions. The thing that I really care about is the quality of the reconstruction x. Now, that statement uh, is a little loaded, uh, and obviously I'm simplifying things a little bit. When I say the quality of the reconstruction, there's many, many ways of measuring quality, and uh, I'm going to hopefully talk a little bit about that at the end, but, um, but um, we can all hopefully agree on various metrics that can assess quality of the reconstruction. Okay, so um, the quality of the reconstruction, as I said, depends on both where you sample in case space and what method you use to reconstruct X. Uh, consider a toy example. Imagine that you're collecting some MRI scans on a population of patients, and the only thing that varies is this one Fourier measurement. Oh, 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 sorry, I, I said it the wrong way around. The one Fourier measurement, let's say, you know, the specific Fourier content never varies. It's constant across all patients, okay? You know, a smart reconstruction method might say, I don't need to measure that. I know it's the same for everyone. You can ignore that measurement, and I'll just impute it with that constant value that I know, okay? So that's essentially a, a reconstruction method that could impute that missing variable that we don't sample um, with this, with this uh, prior information that we have. But you can imagine that another reconstruction method we used does not, have that, does not utilize that type of information, so for that, we might have to sample at that point. It's not imputing that missing variable in an intelligent manner. And, of course, this toy example can be generalized to not a single measurement, but multiple measurements, because there could be a lot of complex multivariate statistical dependencies between the raw case-based data that uh, a, a reconstruction method could leverage uh, to impute missing variables. Now, um, another complication uh, that uh, makes this a very challenging problem is um, that the recom methods that we often rely on are optimizers, okay? They're computationally expensive optimizers. Um, so think about, let's think a little bit about a simple algorithm, okay? Um, let's say we have a 100 by 100 grid 
that we want to undersample. We don't want to acquire all 10,000 samples. We want to undersample by a factor of 10, so acquire 1,000 samples. Um, and let's say somebody gave us fully sampled data, a bunch of images. Those are our training data, XIs. Um, and essentially, we're looking for the best undersampling strategy, the best places to undersample, the, the best 1,000 pixels in that grid to sample from that will give us the best reconstruction quality at the end. Okay? So for every possible subsampling pattern that you give me, the uh, 1,000 uh, potential uh, places to sample from, I will have to solve this reconstruction problem from scratch. Okay? Um, and so uh, on a 10,000 grid with 1,000 um, uh, places to sample from, I have a 10,000 choose 1,000 uh, possible configurations to consider. And the goal of the game here is to find the one mask that gives me the best reconstruction quality on the training data that you gave me. Okay? And if you do the math, it's really easy. Uh, you end up with an opt the, uh, uh, a simple algorithm that would take you know, 10 to the power of 1,000 infinity years, basically. <laughs> Uh, which is stupid, right? You, don't, you never would do that or think about it. But essentially, I want to, that, you know, I want to emphasize how hard this problem is. And, and, and it's hard because it's an integer optimization problem, and it's a nested optimization problem. It's an optimization that has an optimization inside of it. Okay? So we need a better way to do this. Um, and, um, and the way we do this is we, the very first step we wanted to take is we relax the integer optimization problem uh, the, like every sort of tip engineer would, uh, was taught to do um, into a, you know, it's a binary optimization problem. Do we sample here or not? Do we sample here or not? Um, into a probabilistic uh, sampling or a probabilistic decision. So we relax that integer problem into a continuous problem. Um, and the perspective we took is uh, we're only interested in reconstruction accuracy. So we need to think about reconstruction, the method. And we need to think about the optimization of our undersampling mask simultaneously. These are two problems that we need to combine and jointly consider. Uh, we're given a, a bunch of fully sampled data that we could undersample retrospectively for a candidate undersampling strategy, reconstruct those images, and compare the quality objectively. Um, and one other thing that we're going to do is Instead of trying to solve this optimization problem for the reconstruction, this internal optimization problem, explicitly using a numerical strategy, we're going to use this amortized optimization strategy that is learning-based. Okay? I'll elaborate a little bit on that. But the overview of our pipeline is very, very straightforward, actually. So you give the, the, the so this is our method. You give it a bunch of images that, that are fully sampled, that are high quality, high, uh, full resolution images that we call the ground truth MRI scans. You first take them into Fourier domain, take a Fourier transform. Uh, and then for a candidate uh, undersampling mask, you undersample those data. You fill in everything that you haven't sampled with a bunch of zeros. And you take that, the inverse Fourier transform, which has a lot of artifacts and al aliasing and noise artifacts. And then there's this so-called anti-aliasing fil filter, which is this amortized optimization reconstruction uh, method uh, that we denote with A that uh, takes this sort of noisy looking image and cleans it up and looks, turns it into an MRI scan that we'd like to see. Okay? And, the, and the whole process is interested in minimizing the discrepancy between reconstruction and the ground truth. We call our method loop. That stands for learning-based optimization of undersampling pattern. Uh, you will immediately notice that you don't have to use this uh, only for the, uh, for the context of MRIs. You can use this in any uh, compressed sensing context, right? So you can imagine that you can s take the same strategy. Obviously, maybe you don't need the Fourier transforms. And uh, if you have fully sampled data, you're essentially looking for the undersampling, uh, undersampling mask that is optimal for uh, giving you the best reconstructions. Uh, so that's the undersampled case based data. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we relax our problem from integer optimization to a uh, continuous optimization problem, um, where at, what we have is instead of a binary mask that we're looking for, that would be the optimal, like, that would be a candidate undersampling mask, we are looking for a Bernoulli mask, where at every pixel uh, we have a potentially biased coin that we're going to flip and decide whether we're sampling there or not. And that, the bias of that coin, the, uh, the probability of that Bernoulli variable, will be the thing that we're trying to optimize. Okay, that, that's the thing that we're optimizing. 
Um, it's IID, so every point in, uh, is uh, sort of uh, independently, uh, you flip a coin. Um, you, fill in it with, uh, you fill in with zeros where you don't sample, you take the inverse Fourier transform, this is what you get, um, and then you want to clean up the, uh, the noise and artifacts. Um, for those of you who are into neural networks, this is what the, the neural network looks like. Uh, I like to look at these things. Uh, some people, I used to hate looking at these things. Nowadays, I enjoy. Um, and that says something, I guess. But um, so it's basically that pipeline that I showed you in, uh, in the form of a neural network. Okay, so what we have here is, um, you know, th the input image comes in. Uh, there's a fixed layer that takes a Fourier transform. Okay, it's a fully connected layer that has fixed coefficients that are essentially implementing a Fourier transform. Um, at first, it seems stupid to do that to me. Like, um, you know, I'm an engineer. Why would I implement a Fourier transform as a, like a dense layer? Uh, it doesn't seem efficient. Uh, but to be able to implement things in the in the sort of the modern machine learning libraries that we use, uh, that's sort of a simple way to do it. Um, which then um, we multiply element-wise with an undersampling mask. Okay, in this picture. The dots that are black, the pixels that are black are where we sample. Everything that's white, we don't sample there. Okay? Now, where does this mask come from? Well, before that layer, that's a, that's a mask, we have a Bernoulli probability uh, distribution for each pixel. Okay? Um, and essentially, those, the probability values there are the values that we're optimizing for. Those are free coefficients in our model. Okay. Now, because these are probability values, they have to be restricted between 0 and 1. So we have a layer before that that is unrestricted, and then it squashes those numbers into 0 and 1. Okay. Um, once we do the element-wise multiplication between the, the binary mask that is sampled from that Bernoulli distribution and, uh, and the Fourier domain, uh, we get and we sort of do a zero filling, take the inverse Fourier transform, and this is what the, an image that we get. So everything in the top stream there so far is fixed. There are no layers that we're learning. It's like take a Fourier transform, multiply with a binary mask, fill it in with zeros where you don't measure, take an inverse Fourier transform, boom, you get with this image, okay, for, for uh, a sp specific instantiation of that mask. Um, now, from this point onwards, everything onto the right-hand side of this picture is a unit, or a, a, technically it's a residual unit, a specific convolutional neural network architecture that is all full of learnable convolutional uh, kernels, okay? So everything there we're gonna learn, and, um, and essentially the goal of that network is to clean this up and turn it into a reconstruction that looks like our input, okay? We have to train this all end to end. So this is one of my promised equations that I'm showing you. Um, hopefully at least a few of you appreciate it. Uh, it's a loss function that we're gonna optimize. Um, I used to call this an unsupervised loss function because we don't have ground truth labels, but a lot of reviewers objected to that, and now I sort of buy that objection. Um, it's sort of a loss function that is computed directly, you know, you give me full resolution images, uh, I pass it through my network and get a reconstruction out of it, and I comp comp compare my reconstruction to, to, to the input. Um, I don't have, strictly speaking, whys or labels, um, but I have the full resolution image that was given to me as, as training. So, um, so that's why you might think of it as supervised. Um, now, there's a technicality here. Uh, we're, as I said, we relaxed our problem to a probabilistic problem, not an integer optimization problem. So unfortunately, we have to compute expectations. And we have to compute expectations over all possible masks that would result from drawing from that Bernoulli mask, right? This probabilistic mask that we're optimizing for, right? So a given probabilistic mask defines an independent Bernoulli variable for each one of the uh, Fourier coefficients that we're going to, uh, we have, and we flip a coin at each uh, Fourier k-space location uh, and decide whether we're going to sample there or not. Um, so we have to compute this loss function as an expectation over all possible masks. Um, now, the second term in this loss function is computing that reconstruction loss. It's compu uh, comparing the final result to the original input, uh, L1 difference, okay? The first term is essentially a term that is the number of measurements I'm, gonna, I'm acquiring, okay? And that is the one, that's, uh, that, is the one uh, that has a lambda in front of it. Uh, it's essentially 
the one that encourages sparser samples, right? So if we didn't have the first term, the best thing to do would be sample everything, right? The first term here, essentially, if you dial up lambda, makes you sample less and less uh, and trade off the reconstruction quality with the number of samples that you collect. So the first term is essentially the total number of expected samples that you're going to collect from a Bernoulli mask. Now, we get rid of the uh, expectations, OK? And I don't need to get into a lot of the details, but the first term, essentially, there's an analytical form. It's IID Bernoulli. So you know the expectation of a Bernoulli is just the probability value. That's there. The second term is, instead of computing analytical expectations, we switch to Monte Carlo expectations. So we just sample masks. Uh, and for every mask that we sample, we compute a reconstruction loss. We sample a bunch of times. Uh, and then average those reconstruction loss values. And that's our expectation that is empirical. I actually just lied. We don't sample a bunch of times. We sample once. Okay? And um, for anyone who has never done Monte Carlo sampling in neural networks, your immediate reaction is, that's, that's crazy. Okay? Uh, and that was my reaction a year ago. Um, turns out uh, it's actually not as crazy as it sounds because of the whole stochastic gradient descent thing that we do in, uh, in training these neural networks. Um, by sampling a single uh, mask, uh, we still get a no very, very noisy, but still an unbiased estimate of our gradient, uh, which is very useful for optimization. Okay? Um, there's a reparameterization trick that I'm not going to talk about. Um, and, um, and then, Essentially, uh, there's all these implementation details. Everything's implemented in Keras. Um, I'm going to show you some experiments, okay, since I'm running out of time. Um, there are two sets of experiments that we presented. One set went to the conference paper. The other set was primarily done for the journal version of this paper. We're combining the two now. But essentially, the, first, you know, the conclusions are mainly very, very similar. There's an interesting comparison between the two that I'm going to present in the slide. Um, the first set of experiments that I'm going to primarily focus on are structural T1-weighted MRI scans, brain MRI scans. Uh, they came from this data set called the Dubai data set. Um, they're fully sampled at 256 by 256. Uh, resolution, uh, the T1 weighted images. Um, we had 100 training subjects, 50 validation subjects, 10 test subjects. Um, and there was a bunch of reconstruction methods that we wanted to uh, explore. There's this famous one called Aloha, um, TGV, which is a rigorized regression um, optimization strategy. BM3D is a block match matching strategy that I don't need to get into. And then the residual unit. If you give me any undersampling mask, I can train that residual unit component uh, for, as my anti-aliasing fi filter, which is a strategy that was actually proposed in 2018. Um, so here are the undersampling masks that we sort of considered in our experiments. The three on the right um, are, so the first row is 10% undersampling, the second row is 20, uh, sorry, the first row is 10% undersampling, the second row is 5% undersampling, so 20x speed up. Uh, the three on the right, the three columns on the right, are standard undersampling patterns people are using. Uh, the variable density one, uh, which is a Gaussian sort of type thing, a uniform random, and the Cartesian undersampling um, grid. Uh, and the one on the left, the, the ones on the left, the column, uh, is the, the, under, the optimal undersampling mask that our algorithm discovered. Okay, so those are the ones that are just, just came from our data. It's a data driven. Uh, solution, uh, which uh, immediate sort of uh, when we sort of look at this, uh, it's reassuring to see that it's sampling more in the middle. It's reassuring to see that there's this sort of gradually tapering off behavior that we we sort of know empirically that is a good sampling strategy. Um, but it's also not a Gaussian. Uh, if you look carefully, it's sort of. Uh, it could be a superposition uh, of a bunch of Gaussians, but actually it's not a Gaussian. Uh, to me, it looks like more of a, uh, a superposition of three uniform distributions, two that are circular and one that is just uniform on the grid. Um, we haven't really explored that uh, too carefully. Um, and then we did our, fair, like our comparison. You know, we are basically comparing, uh, taking a residual unit and trying different masks, and we get the best result on our, on our method, on, our, the, on the mask that was optimized using loop. Um, you know, we can try loop's mask with different reconstruction methods. Remember, loop was optimized with the unit in mind. 
but we can take, the, take that mask and apply, you know, undersample with that mask and apply it to other uh, reconstruction methods like Aloha, like BM3D. And it turns out rather surprisingly that the loop optimized masks gives us the best reconstruction results with all these alternative um, reconstruction methods as well. Here's some visuals. One thing I want to highlight that the boundary of the putamen when you do a 5% uh, sorry, 5% uh, on something or a 20x acceleration of an MRI scan, you don't see the putamen. It just gets blurred, blurred out. It's a fundamental subcortical structure. Um, but if you actually use the optimized uh, subsampling strategy, you can still see the putamen's boundaries. Um, the second set of experiments were involved a knee MRI, a knee MRI uh, data. This is a data set that was recently released by NYU. Um, pretty interesting data set to play with. Um, and this is essentially some visual results from that data set um, where we, uh, again, I'm showing visuals on, uh, I believe this is like an 8% subsampling um, result where the optimized masks give, give the best sort of reconstruction quality overall. Uh, we have quantitative results that, you know, uh, that are very consistent with the, the brain results. Um, the one thing I want to show you is the optimal mask for knee versus the optimal mask for brain. Okay? That was the thing that I really was interested in looking at, and this is what we see. So for the brain on the right-hand side, that we, we have the optimal mass that I showed you before. Uh, I have a typical brain scan slice on the bottom. Um, and for the knee, we have the optimal mass that Loop found for us uh, on the left. Uh, and the knee MRI scan uh, is on the bottom. And they immediately look very different. This is roughly the same subsampling ratio for the two. Um, and, you know, it's strikingly different, the two subsampling strategies. In fact, the knee subsampling pattern, I've never seen anything like that before, right? So there's nothing out there, no subsampling strategy, no heuristic strategy that people have experimented with that looks like this, okay? I could sort of hypothesize why this is the case, but if you use the one that was optimized for the brain in your experiments, we find that the reconstruction quality uh, is not that great, okay? So the, the, the knee optimized uh, mask does really, really good. Um, the one thing we, I, I think is going on here is that a lot of the edges in the knee MRI scan, the way it's acquired, are actually edges that go up and down. They're vertical edges. Okay? And as a result, a lot of the uh, frequency content, the high frequency content, is in the horizontal direction. And I think what's happening here is uh, when you're sampling, subsampling in the, for the knee data, you need to sample more of the high frequency content in the lateral direction to be able to reconstruct better. Okay? This is not true for the, for, the, for the brain scans, which seem to be more symmetrical. So we propose loop. Uh, it's sort of a way to optimize where to sample from in a compressed sensing scenario in the, uh, with the ultimate goal of reconstruction in mind. Um, there's a few caveats, obviously. Um, the uh, one caveat is we do not take into account the physical cost of sampling, okay? Uh, we just use the number of samples as a proxy for that, which is obviously very simplistic. Uh, we're interested in thinking about the whole sampling trajectory and how this is implemented. Um, the other caveat is we use uh, L1 norm, or the L1 difference between the reconstruction and the input as our quality of uh, reconstruction as, that, as a metric, which a lot of people object to for good reason. Um, you might be interested in a very specific thing uh, in the image, finding the boundaries of a certain structure, uh, detecting a certain pathology, classifying or diagnosing a uh, patient. Uh, and those are things that uh, obviously uh, might not exactly align with L1 norm. So those are things to consider. Um, we're also interested in extending this to the multi-coil setting or parallel imaging setting. Um, and uh, obviously, once all of this is wrapped up, uh, we're actually right now starting a pilot phase of uh, prospectively validating this, implementing this in a real MRI scanner and showing that uh, we can get uh, good reconstructions out of, out of this. Um, this is all our um, funding. Uh, Chala, who did most of this work, was the lead author, who just started working at uh, Siemens, uh, was a Fulbright fellow. Um, and as I said, the publications are all online. You can find them, and the code's online too. Thank you. Just one minute.
All right, we'll take a couple of questions. If we get the final spotlight presenters up over here, that'd be great too. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you for the great talk. I have a couple of questions. One is the difference in sampling pattern between brain and knee. Um, do you see similar differences just in the average power spectrum of the different types of MRI scans? Yes. Okay, and so you would expect that? Yes, you do, for that, sure. Okay. In fact, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's possible that a lot of this is driven by the difference in the power spectrum. Okay. I hope that's not true, because <laughs> that would be a trivial answer to all of this. Um, but I suspect it's not true, actually, because I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to look into it. I, you know, I don't want to hypothesize. Okay. But yeah, and then question. second question, so do you think it could, you could benefit at all from using um, like a, a de dependency structure in your sampling pattern, right? Right now you model the joint distribution over all in, in case space as IID, and have you thought about modeling any dependency structure of that distribution? Um, I, that, that's a good question too. I, I really don't know if that would bias a lot. Because, um, you know, that's... Um, at the end of the day, the thing that I'm really after is a binary mask, right? And the binary mask uh, that I would like to find uh, essentially could account for the dependency structure, right? So imagine that there's two points that are very, very correlated, that look, let's say perfect, cor perfectly correlated. The optimal binary mask would be either one and zero or one and zero, it doesn't matter, right? Mm. Um, so what I've done is I've relaxed that binary mask search to a continue. So the Bernoulli could be like 99%, 0.01%. You know, I don't, so I feel the dependency structure is a sort of a separate issue that is more about the reconstruction side. Uh, and the Bernoulli, the IID assumption in the Bernoulli really wouldn't add too much to that. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, uh, so one question is about the optimization objective. It looks very similar to stochastic variational inference. So have you considered that detection? It might be a lower bound on something else. Uh, the second question is, you mentioned L1 has issues from the standpoint of uh, practical, uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, but from the optimization perspective also, when you use gradient-based methods, L1 does not work very well. So uh, is that also one of the reasons why you would want to consider other loss loss uh, functions? Uh, good questions. I mean, the, for, the, for the first question, uh, it could be a lower bound, but I, you know, I really don't care in the sense that you know, we wrote down exactly what we were interested in, which is the quality of the reconstruction plus the sparsity, sort of how many samples are we collecting. Um, so I wasn't, I, we didn't really think of this as a, like a lower bound of a different objective function. Um, the second question, um, I, you know, I think you have a very valid point. Uh, the L1 norms that we sort of used have this issue of differentiability and, and causing headache for gradient descent. Um, in fact, I think that's what, you know, right now we're in the middle of running everything with an L2 reconstruction loss. The reason we didn't do L2 reconstruction loss in the first version of all of this was somehow we were convinced that L1 loss gives us sharper looking images. I'm not sure that's always true, but uh, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Um, yeah, so, so for the reconstruction, um, we are considering L2 loss, but that, again, has a caveat of being just a global similarity measure. Um, and I think, for me, the more interesting question is, um, I don't really often care about globally how good the quality of this image is. I mean, for a lot of background voxels or pixels, I might not care at all about the quality of the, uh, the reconstruction. I really care about finding the MS lesion or delineating the boundaries of a tumor. Uh, and and uh, in a clinical setting, often you have a very concrete application like that. And to me, having that application in mind and, and customized loss function that reflects that goal is more important than anything. So I'd more interested in that direction. Uh, are you hinting at generative adversarial networks? Um, no. Okay. That's a long discussion, but I can. I have uh, I have very fundamental uh, concerns about adversarial strategies. Yeah. Do you have a, this one last question, or do, are we out of time? I think we're out, I think of, time. We're out of time, but we, I can talk offline. All right, let's thank Mert.